The Memphis Grizzlies have one practice in the books, and thankfully, it sounds like it was a competitive session. I'm going to be your host for this episode, Joe Mullinax, and on Locked On Grizzlies, we're going to talk about the importance of getting off to a fast start, how significant the hiring of Coach St. Andrews will be for the Grizzlies offense, and we'll also take a closer look at the Derrick Rose effect and my uh, change of opinion on the gentleman. We'll talk about that more on this episode of Locked On Grizzlies. Lock in with me. You are Locked On Grizzlies, your daily Memphis Grizzlies podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, hello once again. This is indeed Locked on Grizzlies, and I am, of course, Joe Mullinax, your host for this episode of the show. My co-host, Michael Cole, the commercial appeal there in Memphis, Tennessee. He's been very busy the last couple of days getting back into the swing of things. He's catching his breath today on this Wednesday edition of the podcast. I hope you'll forgive him for that. And I hope that you will enjoy him the next couple of days because he'll be closing out the week with you. I'm still very much in the thick of my day job. And I've got some uh, games coming up myself over the next couple of evenings and days. So DeMichael will have our Thursday and Friday edition of the podcast for you. So you'll get to end your week with him solo. You've got me on this wild and wonderful Wednesday edition of Lockdown Grizzlies. Free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on YouTube as well. Like, comment, rate, review, subscribe. Hopefully you'll be coming every day or with us here on Locked On Grizzlies. And trust us to be a source for your NBA and Memphis Grizzlies content consumption. Practice one in the books. And if you don't follow at DeMichael C on X or Twitter, whatever the heck it's called, you most certainly should because he had lots of good content coming out from the practice. The big story, as it probably always will be, was John Morant being in the fold. Sounds like he was running with the second unit, according to DeMichael and others that were there at the practice, which makes total sense, right? John's not going to be a starter, even though he's able to practice and travel and be around the team. Uh, He's not going to be a starter. He's not even going to be allowed in the building once two hours before a game hits. DeMichael talked about that on our episode yesterday. So it doesn't make sense for him to be running with the ones right now. It makes sense for him to be probably the best scout team point guard in the NBA giving those guys looks, creating issues for them, finding weaknesses in defenses, and really kind of prioritizing how he can be a servant leader and how he can help his teammates be better as they prepare for a start of the season without him at least on the floor during games. Desmond Bain talked about how it was a really intense start, and I'm happy to hear that because I want to see them shake things up a bit. We'll talk about that throughout this episode of the show offensive evolution, things that I would like to see change that DeMichael has talked about, the arrival of Coach St. Andrews from Milwaukee. Real opportunity there for the Grizzlies with some changeover and turnover in the coaching staff to have some adjustments made. And that doesn't mean that the system is broken. It just means that evolution is important. Evolving your scheme is important. Evolving the way you practice is important. That was talked about by DeMichael as well as Drew Hill over the Daily Memphian and their reports from practice. The idea of non-negotiables, which I love, right? As a coach myself, I love that idea. These are the non-negotiables. You have them with your players. You can have them as a parent, right? With my daughters, Caroline and Abby, here are the non-negotiables. With my son, Mitchell, you got to brush your teeth. You got to do the things you're supposed to do before you get the stuff that you want. With your players, you have to control your effort and and your attitude. You have to go out there and control the things that you can control. Anything that doesn't take talent, you should be able to master because you have the opportunity to control that aspect of your athletic career. Obviously, as you expand into professional basketball, professional sports in general, that gets a lot harder to tell a millionaire. But the fact still remains, if you are in a spot where you can grow the intangible items of the game, your conditioning, the way that you attack defensively. So much of defense, especially in the NBA, is focused on effort, just the desire to move your feet and be a competitor and do those things that are necessary. It's hard to flip that switch and just jump straight into a practice and be able to do those things. 
you have to develop those habits and you have to develop that mentality from the get-go. And it sounds like they are prioritizing that early, which makes me happy as someone who saw this team and thought, to be honest with you, they were lackadaisical at times. They rested on their laurels. And I think that's part of why they are where they are. Obviously, health plays a role in that. There's lots of other pieces and components that fit into that. But you still have to make adjustments. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, right? If the Grizzlies didn't make changes with Coach Darko heading out to Toronto as the head coach there, wonderful opportunity for him. But they had to make some staff changes. They had to do some overturn. It was an opportunity to do some self-evaluation. How can we practice better? How can we run our offense better? What are some things that we can tweak? And you always want to hear that those adjustments have been made because that shows attention to detail. That shows a prioritization of getting these guys outside of their comfort zone and finding where they are best enabled to push themselves within the team environment. Because obviously they all have their own individual coaches, their own workouts they do. They work out at the team facility and things like that. But when they're back together as a unit, the energy is just different in the gym because they are one. They're no longer pieces of an inconsistent whole. They are once again 100% united under that Grizzlies banner. And as that occurs, what that banner represents has to continue to adjust and evolve and adapt. And obviously with players like Marcus Smart and Derek Rose now in the fold, that's only going to continue to adjust and evolve and adapt. So it was good to see John Morant out there. It was good to hear that the team practiced hard. It was good to get a vibe for how players are excited to be there, how there's a workmanlike mentality. We'll talk more about Derek Rose later on in the show. But the idea of him seeing a championship mindset. That's what you want to hear if you're a fan. That's what you want to see if you're someone that follows this team and hopes for their success, because there has to be a maturation process. I wouldn't say over the last four years that they have 100% all the time had a championship mindset. It hasn't been there. They have focused on other things. They have focused on smoke and drip and whatever else you want to say in terms of getting attention, being a fun team to follow, as people say, the most fun in terms of a team and their ebbs and flows, peaks and valleys of a build is when they're right before they're going to be good, right? That was about a year or so ago for the Grizzlies. Eh, there's not expectations yet. If they lose, it's okay. You understand they're still young, but boy, are they fun to watch. We're past that point in this Grizzlies run. The expectation is to win now. And not just win in the regular season. They've done that for two straight years. Now the expectation is to win in the postseason. That's why Marcus Smart is here. That's why, to a lesser extent, Derrick Rose is here. That's why they have done the things that they've done to try to build this core around their three best players, Morant, Bain, and Jaron Jackson Jr. Now is the time to win. You have to come ready to work just about each and every day. They're human beings. They have lives. They have things going on off the court that may impact them. But each and every day, as professional athletes, their job is to prepare themselves, mind, body, and spirit, to go and be on a championship level. Not every team is of that mindset right now. The Grizzlies need to be. And I think that it's good to hear that they're in that place early on. Again, you want to start fast. You want to have the opportunity to recover later if necessary, make the tweaks and adjustments. We'll talk more about the offensive evolution here momentarily, what that could potentially look like. What are some things I hope to see more of from this Grizzlies team heading into this next chapter of this era now that they've made a trade with first-round picks, bringing in someone like Marcus Smart. It's time to win now. No more fingers crossed. Hopefully they win. No more feel-good vibes if they lose because they have time in front of them. It's starting to run out. Not necessarily in terms of their core three dudes. They're still all very young. But in terms of their ability to make smart maneuvers around them because of the financial impact of these contracts that are being signed, now is the time to take that step, to make that additional leap forward. And that takes and starts with a mindset. Wonderful to hear that they've got it right now. Hopefully they can maintain it. 
It's not just a mindset, of course. It also comes down to execution of scheme. And we'll talk a little bit about offensive tweaks that could be coming and things I'd like to see here in a moment on Locked on Grizzlies. But first, this episode of Locked on Grizzlies is brought to you by Abada. Big fan of Abada. Abada is wonderful. And as the weather gets cooler, it's time to stock your closet up with winter clothes. Abada can help you get some cash back in your pocket, a little jingle in your pocket to get some winter coats, hats, gloves, scarves, and more for the whole family as the weather turns cooler. The average Abada user earns $100 a year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip. Or you could use your cash back to buy a flight you've been eyeing, a game you've been dying to go to, fancy dinner that you've been craving. Other apps might give you points that don't amount to very much, but with Abada, you can get real cash back that you can cash out to your bank account, pay PayPal, or gift cards. Download the Abada app now and use the code LOCKED to start earning real cash back. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Abada app and use the code LOCKED. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store and use the code LOCKED. The offense is evolving for the Memphis Grizzlies. What could that mean? We'll talk about that next here on Lockdown Grizzlies. Welcome back to Lockdown Grizzlies. I am Joe Molinax, your host for this episode of the podcast. Very happy to be with you on this wild and wonderful Wednesday. To Michael Cole of the Commercial Appeal, my co-host for this podcast, not with us today, catching his breath after a sprint to start the NBA season with the Memphis Grizzlies. But he will have the Thursday and Friday editions of the show as I close out a busy week myself. Uh, he will close out the next two episodes, and then we'll be back together for our Monday episode of the show. And we'll have some actual basketball to talk about in that one. Obviously, I'm sure he'll discuss practice and all the other things going on with the Grizzlies. But on Monday show, the Grizzlies open their preseason on Sunday evening, and we'll have some basketball to discuss. And we'll see the first hints of an offensive evolution that Coach St. Andrews from the Milwaukee Bucks appears to be spearheading. He is now of the Memphis Grizzlies, of course, after some staff overturn. And Taylor Jenkins has a relationship with this gentleman, knows him from the Milwaukee days and that Buden holds her connection. And I think that regardless of what St. Andrews does, it's going to be good that they're making changes, right? I mentioned earlier in the show, you want to see evolution. You want to push that envelope and see how far you can take it. None of that is bad. And when you're at the stage that the Grizzlies are at, self-scouting is important. If you were to sit down and Taylor Jenkins is a defensive particular coach, he's an expert at that area of basketball, I think it's fair to say, watching the Grizzlies' defenses over the last few years. You want to look at yourself and say, if I was playing me, how would I beat me, right? How would I beat myself as a basketball coach? What are some sets that I would run? What are some coverages, some schemes that I would throw out there? That's part of being a good coach and evolving and growing your program growing and evolving your philosophies. With Darko now in Toronto, head coach of the Raptors, it was a great opportunity to shake things up, and I do think St. Andrews is going to do just that. Not that it's going to look like the Milwaukee offense, perfect period, word for word, but I do think that you will see a renewed focus on ball movement, a renewed focus on screen setting off ball, which is extremely vital for a team that has shooters like Desmond Bain, Luke Kennard. In order to get those guys open looks, it can't just all be dribble penetration, isolation, pick and roll sets. There has to be evolution. There has to be variety. It's the spice of life. So when you see and hear, whether it's Drew Hill of the Daily Memphian, to Michael, of course, of the Commercial Appeal, and right here on Lockdown Grizzlies, this idea of St. Andrews coming in and really kind of shaking up the offense. For a team that was 25th in half court offense last year, not much higher they can go or not much lower they can go, right? The only real place for them to go is up. There's only four teams in the NBA that are five teams that had a worse half court offense than that. So, how do you do it? You create opportunity for your shooters, you get your ball handlers, your facilitators of offense in different positions on the floor to start those sets. You become less predictable because that's one of the toughest parts i would imagine of being an nba coach and being an nba player everybody runs a lot of the same stuff right and when it's professionally your job to watch these sets to watch these plays to break down film 
you hear stories all the time about guys calling out sets before they happen. So variety is the spice of life. You don't want to make it easier for these teams, these veteran players in particular, to come in and already know, up oh, Memphis Grizzlies game. Got to watch for John Morant on the pick and roll. He's going to try to find some dribble penetration. They have drop coverage on defense, blah, 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 blah. You don't want it to be that simple. You want to have the switchability on the defensive end. And on the offensive end, you have to have sets and thoughts and processes within what you do to enable other guys to be scoring threats. Luke Kennard is far too good of a shooter to just camp out in the corner. There's no reason he can't run around a screen in the high post from a horn set with two bigs. There's no reason he can't cut through the baseline and come off an off-ball screen and have an open look. Doing that with not just Luke Kennard, but also with Desmond Bain. Here's a wild idea. Doing it with John Morant and having an additional cut, a pin-down screen. There's so many different things that this team can do to make their offense less predictable, especially when John Morant is on the floor. There's always a question, how come the Grizzlies seemed to have more success? They weren't better. But how come the Grizzlies seemed to have more success with Tyus Jones as the starter at times? Because the offense was different. Tyus made extra passes. The ball moved. There was stability within the execution of the scheme. When Jaw has the ball in his hands, oftentimes it's pick and roll looking for drill penetration. That is too vanilla. There has to be evolution. Jaw's phenomenal. He's a tremendous athlete. But you have to have an offensive scheme and set where it's not just one guy who's the priority. Desmond Bain has proven that he can carry a harder and larger load. Jaron Jackson Jr. has proven that he can carry a harder and larger load, offensively speaking. Give them chances. Let them be the focal points. Let them have the opportunity to initiate offense. Don't make Marcus Smart be the primary facilitator each and every time. He doesn't have to be. If it's Luke Kennard that starts, let him do some of that. Steven Adams in the high post can do some of those things too. Opportunity presents itself within renewal of a staff. That's what Taylor Jenkins has in front of him. And if he wants to keep his job in Memphis long-term, I think it would be silly to say that a guy who's had the number two record in the Western Conference each of the last two seasons is on the hot seat. But there's no denying that there's an increase in expectation even with the John Morant suspension. The fans, the organization at large, they want to see a return to form in terms of winning playoff series. You have to have a functional half-court offense to do that. And last season, they didn't. They're far too dependent on individual performances and individual players just simply existing in that space. There was no consistent offensive set where I could watch them and go, all right, here's where they're going to run this for Luke Kennard. Here's where they're going to run this for Desmond Bain. They're going to be able to get a look off of this. So often, especially when Morant was out there, sure, they ran plays, but how much of it was developed with the understanding that Jaw can't do it alone, and he probably shouldn't do it in ISO pick-and-roll opportunities almost every time down the floor in crunch time in particular. You have to be confident and comfortable enough in what you're doing that you trust your players to do their jobs. And the players have to trust these coaches as they implement these changes because change is hard, right? Darko going to Toronto, that's hard. That's an underrated aspect of this training camp getting integrated with new coaches, new schemes, new systems, new ideas. But if that can happen rapidly, and if they can attack it aggressively, which it sounds like they've done starting with day one on Tuesday, if they can push, I think that you'll see growth. And it may not happen immediately. And again, we're not going to see jaw until the middle of December. And because of that, as I've said, we don't really know who this Grizzlies team is going to be. But I do think it's fascinating to watch this unfold. And I look forward to Sunday's preseason game, not because of who's starting, but because I want to see those wrinkles offensively. I want to see, they're not going to show everything, of course. It's the first week of training camp. But I want to see them show that they are cognizant of the things that they struggled with. They have to find ways to get more spacing. They have to be able to get 
players like Desmond Bain and Jaron Jackson Jr. involved. And by proxy, they're going to have to because John Morant's not going to be there. But eventually, John Morant will be there. And the growth in the offensive skill and sets of the Grizzlies between now and December 19th is going to play a massive role in just how much Jaw makes a difference on this Grizzlies team, especially offensively when he does come back. When we come back here on Lockdown Grizzlies, we're going to finish out this episode of the show talking about Derrick Rose. Yesterday, I did something that I hate doing. I admitted that I'm wrong. I was wrong about the Derrick Rose signing. He doesn't have to play a minute. He's already going to make a massive difference. And that process continues next here on Lockdown Grizzlies. Stay with us. Welcome back to Lockdown Grizzlies. I am Joe Molinax, your host for this episode of the show. To Michael Cole, my co-host. Not with me today, but he will be with you on Thursday and Friday, closing out the week. So thank you to DeMichael for that. I will be back with you and DeMichael on Monday's episode of the show, breaking down the first Grizzlies preseason game and, of course, so much more. we got a couple episodes between now and then, breaking down additional things from practice. And we'll close out this show talking about that Derrick Rose effect because, as I said on the Tuesday edition of the podcast, you know, if you've been listening to me, following my work, over at Bluff City Media, going back to the Grizzly Bear Blues days. I don't like admitting when I'm wrong because it happens so rarely, right? It's hard for me to tell when an incorrect statement gets uttered because I just don't do it very often. It's so rare, right? But I do think that it's important to acknowledge that the, the Derek Rose interview on Monday at Media Day was just tremendous. And he deserves all the credit in the world for the ability. Again, we talked about self-reflection, the ability to self-scout with Taylor Jenkins earlier in the show. Derrick Rose very clearly has self-scouted. He's found some peace with what he's been, where he's been, and he feels very comfortable with who he is now. And that in and of itself is valuable to a Memphis Grizzlies team that is so young and is still so immature in a lot of ways. They need a presence like Derrick Rose, who's a former MVP, a former best player in the league, who has had growing pains of his own. That is hugely significant. As I've said before, if if John Morant can't learn from that guy, that guy probably ain't the problem. It's probably John Morant. And that chance to have Derrick Rose, Marcus Smart, I'm sure we'll talk more about, of course, as well. But Rose has really been the star of the show so far. And you hear Taylor Jenkins talking about wanting to hear more from Rose because of that experience that he's had because of the miles that he's traveled, the teams that he's been on the different roles from an MVP player to a reserve, to a six man candidate, six man of the year award candidate. He's done it just about all in the NBA, give or take a ring or two. Right. And this guy has so much experience on top of being someone that players should look up to because of what he's accomplished. That experience goes beyond the court. Taylor Jenkins just wants these young players to hear about it more. Derrick Rose has openly said that's not a strength of his. Derrick Rose is a quieter guy, lead by example kind of guy. That's not what Taylor Jenkins wants. He said that in media availability after practice or part of practice. Put yourself out there more, Derrick. These guys will listen to you, Derrick. When coaches say it over and over again, it becomes coach speak. It becomes something that can go in one ear and out the other. But when somebody, the level and status of Derrick Rose can say, I know what you've been through. You are doing it wrong. Here's why. Let me help you. Let me explain. Let me push you, right? Derrick Rose made it very clear. He's not a babysitter. That's not what his goal is being a member of the Memphis Grizzlies. He wants to compete. He wants to win. And he looks to push. John Morant in that process. He looks to push the Grizzlies backcourt players in that process. It's not going to be easy. And that makes me happy to hear. Because again, whether it's the intensity of practice, whether it's the adjustments offensively, the attention to detail in terms of leadership, shakeups needed to occur. Doesn't mean that you cut guys. Doesn't mean that you make trades uh, for the sake of making trades. It does mean that you bring in veterans who are prepared to impart wisdom, not because they're babysitting or because they're assistant coaches by default. Rose is going to play, especially early on with John Morant out. But you want to have somebody in that spot that they can look to, 
especially jaw and say that guy knows what he's talking about because he was literally there no disrespect to taylor jenkins he's never been there right neither have i i've never been an nba player never will be taylor jenkins not an nba player you can respect your coach and the knowledge and work that they put in and that statement still be true so when a player like derrick rose comes in and echoes what jenkins says or when a player like derrick rose comes and again Ja, I made that same move in 2011. It didn't work for me then. It's not going to work for you now. Here's why. Imagine that film session. Imagine that sit-down conversation. Getting to pick the brain of one of the best lead point guards of this century. That's not hyperbole. That's true. And while that some of that ability may have left Derrick Rose, it doesn't change the fact that, A, he once had that level of ability, and, B, he has the memory of what it took to get to that place and how to take advantage of that ability that John Morant currently possesses. How often, and Derek Rose said this in media day availability, how often does a star player of a modern era get to play next to the guy that was him before he was him? Derek Rose and John Morant have very comparable games. Derek Rose can help Ja get to the next level. Not just physically, but mentally. Not just mentally, but emotionally. He doesn't have to do it through babysitting. He can do it from trying to kick John Morant's ass in practice. He can do it through pushing him that way. He can do it through conversations in the locker room, developing relationships. He can do it with the entire team by vocalizing what needs to be done. Because Derrick Rose has seen success. Marcus Smart has seen success. Leadership by example is great, but there has to be a voice. There has to be someone that can be that guiding sound toward whatever the stated goal is. Marcus Smart's probably that guy, but I think Derrick Rose is more that guy than we give him credit for, and or at least that I gave him credit for. And he had another strong availability after practice on Tuesday, talking about the intensity, talking about the mindset. He has to help establish that. On the court, Play 12 minutes or so a game. Get to the basket. Find an open shooter. Get to your spot in the pull-up jumper range. Give us some buckets. Give us spurts. Give us a chance while Dez and or Marcus Smart cannot be that guy that runs the point. We'll talk more about the on-the-court stuff. I believe that he's fresh, and I think that he'll have some success with the opportunity that he's presented. He's not going to be the guy that he was in New York when he was sixth man of the year candidate. It's extremely unlikely. The good news is the Grizzlies don't need him to be that. They need him to be a steady hand. They need him to be a competitor. They need him to come in and be able to keep the ship afloat while Morant is out. And they need him to be an example, not just for Ja, but for the entire organization of what it means to evolve as a player. Because the fact that Derrick Rose is still playing NBA basketball in 2023, considering all the things that he's gone through injury-wise, all the stuff off the court, it's a testament to however he's running his body and developing himself as a person too. That will carry and pay dividends for these Grizzlies if they're willing to pay attention and listen. Speaking of listening, thank you for listening or watching this episode of Locked On Grizzlies. It is appreciated. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check us out on YouTube. Like, comment, rate, review, subscribe. Hopefully you're an everydayer to Locked On Grizzlies, a proud member of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team each and every day. And if you're not, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button. Check us out each and every time that a new episode drops wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube. The next time that you are with DeMichael on Locked On Grizzlies, because again, he'll close out the week with the last two episodes as I continue my grind of a, of a football season as a high school football coach. DeMichael Cole will be with you. He will talk to you about practice. He'll cover, preview all the things going into the open practice, give you some details on that. Probably a little bit more depth into to how uh, Stephen Adams is going through practice, what he's doing. Is he going to be available on Sunday? I'm sure a lot of those topics will come up in the next couple of shows. Thank you so much for being with me on this wonderful Wednesday edition of the podcast. Can't wait to catch you on Monday. Make sure you come back to chat with the Michael on Thursday and Friday about all things Memphis Grizzlies. Until then, free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Stay locked in. This is Joe Molinax, and you've been